I'm thankful that the Lord gathered us today, and I pray with all of my heart that you will find uh, in the service, the, the, the praying that has been offered and will be offered, the, the singing that we have just concluded, and the, the hearing of the word both read and preached, that our hearts will be drawn to our Savior that our hearts and minds will be filled with a love for him and that uh, we might know his presence here this morning. <clears throat> I think I can forego our usual announcements other than if you have a cell phone, would you please check it and make sure that it's on mute? And open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, we're going to read verses 12 through 14 again. <clears throat> okay, if you would please stand with me, we will read the inspired and infallible Word of God. These are God's words, beginning in verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Amen. Amen. Let's unite our hearts in prayer. Uh, Holy Father, we come. I trust, expecting thy blessing, thy grace, thy mercy, thy love. Father, bless us with the presence of thy holiness. We thank thee for the blessed word preached to us on Wednesday. Lord, heaven is filled with the praise of thy glory, the praise of thy holiness. And Lord, may our hearts be caught up to that glorious scene. O oh God, on thy throne, Blessed Christ, seated at the Father's right hand in splendor and majesty and holiness, the very centerpiece of heaven. Lord, the heavenly citizens, the angels, and the saints that have gone before us, shout thy praises. It is drawn out of them, O God. Their hearts and their desires are towards thee. And Lord, may it be so for us this morning. Oh, God, may our hearts point to true north, to the, to the very right hand of God Almighty, where Christ, our prophet, our priest, and our king is seated in glory. Oh, how we praise thee, Lord Jesus. How beautiful thou art. And I pray that that day is fast coming when we will see thee in thy beauty, that we will see thee in thy splendor, we will see the King in all his beauty. O oh Christ, thou art the fountain, truly the deep, sweet well of love. And we long to know that love here this morning. Father, may, may it please thee as we have offered up our praises, our weak and feeble prayers, which have been helped by the Holy Spirit and and taken by Christ and made lovely to thee. 
As those have gone up, we pray that thy mighty blessings would come down. Please, O Christ, please shower thy blessings upon thy people. Let us know thy holy presence. Let us taste and see. Let us drink from the fountain of life. Lord, this is thy temple. This is the glorious temple of the Holy Spirit. Father, the tabernacle, which was earthly, the temple, which was earthly, knew thy presence with such glory, with such greatness that it drove the very priests out. O Christ, come by the power of thy spirit and fill us with that blessed glory. Bring holy glory to thy name by meeting with us. Lord, there are lost ones here. Draw them to thee with the cords of love this morning. Oh, Father, how I pray that thou wouldst come and that thou wouldst edify thy people by the power of thy spirit. May the word come forth with clarity, with power, with life-giving, life-creating forces. And oh, God, may the church be edified, built up in the faith, Fill our hearts with thy spirit so that our mouths will be filled with thy praise and our minds will be on fire, a holy fire in love for thee. Do it, O God. And we ask it all in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. In part two of this message, we defined several important terms that will be a part of our series of sermons on mortification until we conclude it. Justification is the forensic, the the legal term which describes God's work of grace in which he declares us righteous by faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Sanctification is that glorious work of God's Spirit in which He makes believers righteous, enabling us more and more to die to sin and to live in righteousness. Dying to sin means mortification, and living in righteousness is vivification. Now finally, and by the way, those are the two parts of sanctification. We must always bear that in mind, and we will speak more of that later in this message. Finally, indwelling sin is that powerful inward principle within the believer that is inclined to sinful thoughts, words, and deeds. That principle is the source of the believer's sins and therefore the source of his sorrows. It is the believer's greatest enemy and the object of the believer's mortification. Please don't miss that. Mortification is about pulling up by the roots the very principles of indwelling sin within us. We then continued a primary thought that began in part one. In this text, Paul issues a conditional promise about mortification and eternal life. He tells us in verse 12 that believers are under no obligation to live according to the dictates and power of their sinful flesh. This is a crucial statement for Christian living. I cannot press this enough. I 
I pray that the Holy Spirit will stamp it on your heart as long as you live in this world. You are under no obligation whatsoever to obey or follow the impulses and the power and temptations of your flesh. Paul then warns that those who live according to their flesh, they're not carnal Christians, they're lost. This is what he's telling us. You are governed by your flesh, that principle and power, or you are governed by the Holy Spirit. There is no middle ground. One or the other governs your life. Now, it's true. The power of indwelling sin influences the believer, but it is not his Lord. That's good news. If we live according to the flesh, if we are governed by our flesh and its desires, we are spiritually dead already and will suffer the second death in the eternal flames of hell. Now following that in verse 13, he gives us a sharp contrast. But, but then follows a condition. If ye mortify the deeds of the body, who is the ye? If ye mortify the deeds of the body, the answer is Christians. Only Christians, only regenerate souls, only those who walk after the Spirit can mortify the sinful deeds of the body because they are in Christ. They're in union with the resurrected Lord and Savior. And the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells within them. What, what good news. I need a power stronger than I have to get up tomorrow and follow Christ. To finish this sermon. And glory be to God, He gives us the very Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Well... Paul then revealed the power to meet that condition, which, of course, I've just articulated. If ye through the Spirit, the condition is clear. If Christians through the Spirit mortify the deeds of the body. <clears throat> the Almighty Spirit that created the world, the universe, the Almighty Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the indwelling power by which believers assassinate their sins. That's the power by which you wage war against your sins. Now I ask you, are your flimsy, fleshy sins greater and more powerful than the power that created the universe. So, then we should be thinking in terms of going into that warfare with confidence in our God and in the spirit that he gives us. Lastly, Paul connected a promise to the condition if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Believers do not and cannot earn or merit salvation by mortifying their sins. That isn't what that verse is promising. Rather, their acts of killing their sins reveal that the Spirit of life dwells within them. That's true. You can praise God all day on that one. Right? All right. Is it so? If the Spirit of God dwells within you, 
It doesn't matter what your sins are or what they threaten or how powerfully Satan tempts you. You can overcome it. It tells us that Jesus filled with the Spirit went into his temptations. And he withstood them. <clears throat> it is the same spirit, my brother and my sister, that you have. It is the same spirit. <clears throat> I say, then why do we have so much trouble? Well, we're going to be talking about that. The fact of the matter is we're still dragging around, as we've seen in our previous message, we're still dragging around the flesh which in its nature is uh, the very source of our weakness. The flesh is still sinful. But we're going to talk about some great news when we take up that part of the message shortly. <clears throat> so, with all of that, we return to our sermon. And it's entitled, Killing Sin by God's Spirit. This is part Three. May God, our Heavenly Father, our loving Heavenly Father, move in our souls by the Spirit that dwells within us. And may we know the power of the Spirit and realize the great work of grace that God has worked for all those who are in Christ. No child of God is left out. Oh, we have great reason to praise God. Well, <clears throat> as I mentioned, now as we take up our outline, Paul issues a conditional promise about mortification and eternal life. This is rooted in chapter 8, the, the second part, the B part of verse 13. And we will look shortly and briefly at verse 14. You see in your outline <clears throat> the headings uh, that we have already reviewed. That's why they're grayed out. <clears throat> but they're there to show you the, the unfolding of Paul's thought, which uh, brings us to the last thought under this heading today. <clears throat> Paul gives us a sharp contrast, but Paul gives us a condition if you mortify the deeds of the body. Paul reveals the persons to whom this condition is given. If ye, Christians, Paul shows us how we meet the condition through the Spirit, and then Paul connects a promise to that condition. Ye shall live. I'm glad it doesn't say ye might. That's right. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Ye shall live. Ye shall live. And that brings us to our sixth thought under that heading. Paul then identifies God's people. As many as are led by the Spirit. This is verse, takes us into verse 14. Inspired by God's Spirit, Paul says for, vital word, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. This is a vital description and definition of Christians. Let me repeat that. Listen carefully. I don't know if I'm a Christian or not. God will tell you right here with this verse. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. That is, I repeat, it is a vital description and definition of Christians down through every age of Christ's church, every age, 
God still has a people on the face of this earth, and He will until the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And among the many things that identify them as God's children, that in fact identifies them as God's elect, is that they are led by, they are governed by the Holy Spirit. For that reason, this verse is easily misused and abused. In our day, some take this verse out of its context to say, if you are led by the Spirit, you will speak in tongues. Therefore, only those who speak in tongues are truly saved. Some of you, no doubt, have heard that. <clears throat> but the context does not permit nor even hint at that interpretation. The word for at the beginning of verse 14 is essential. It's crucial to understanding what's being said here. <clears throat> It means that Paul is clarifying, restating, and amplifying what he has just said in verse 13. Again, let me repeat that. I don't want you to miss this. Spirit of God, help us. You must understand that sometimes the most important verses, uh, the most important words in a verse are the little insignificant looking ones. But the word for connects what's being said in verse 13 to uh, in verse 14 to verse 13. This is crucial. And in this context, for means that Paul is clarifying, restating, and amplifying what he's just said in verse 13. In other words, if you are led by the Spirit, then you will be killing sin. That's the marker. Not speaking in tongues, not any of, of the uh, generally referred to charismatic or apostolic gifts. It is those who are at work murdering their sins that alone are Christians. Now, I can hear some of you. You know, Pastor Jeff, you hit that thing about people really not being Christians a lot. Yes, <clears throat> number one, because Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Jesus filled with the Spirit, and the other apostles bring it up in their writings over and over again. It's right here in front of us. I'm not reading this into the text. Paul is telling you who is a Christian and who is not a Christian. Because your own flesh and Satan and the powers of darkness will do everything to tell you you're not a Christian when you are. And that you are a Christian when you're not. You need to know the Bible's markers. It doesn't matter what I think. I'm a vessel of dust. I'm going to be gone soon. But the book is still going to be here. If you are led by the Spirit, then you will be killing sin. Because that's what the Spirit is given to us for, among other things. If we are not in the battle, if we're not killing sin, Sin, something is very wrong with us if we're professing to be Christians. Because it's only Christians that engage this in God's way. Now, there are people all the time that are lost that try to stop their, uh, their bad habits. They know there are certain things that are bad and, and wrong. They probably would never use the word wicked. But they know that, uh-oh, well, I'm destroying my body or I'm destroying somebody else. Therefore, I know this isn't right. And uh, I'll try to stop doing that. And some of them are successful in stopping a bad habit. It happens all the time. 
But that's not mortification. I mean, I, uh, throughout my life, I've, I've known people that, that, uh, that were heavy smokers. And they'd say, I know i got to quit this. I know i got to quit this. I mean, this is an expensive habit. It's a nasty habit. I need to quit. <clears throat> so they quit, and they gained 30 pounds. What happened there? How is that connected? Their drive to smoke simply went into their drive to eat. The drive's still there. Paul is talking about us going after the drive. The lost man cannot do this. The, the apostles' point is that by the guidance and by the power of God's Holy Spirit in them, God's children are perpetually at war with their sins. They understand that soon after their, and they understand that very soon after their conversion. If you're truly converted, <laughs> even if you don't know the word mortification, you're at it. And I will explain more of that in just a few moments. It is when the Lord began to deal with me and my wife, we were repenting with all of our hearts. I'd, been, I'd grown up and had been in, in churches and circles where repentance was for the Jews. That's not for Gentiles. All Gentiles have to do is believe. They don't have to repent. And I'm repenting my heart out, not realizing what I was doing. I didn't have the word for it because it wasn't a vocabulary in my church. But I was changing my mind that led me to a change of life. Because why? If you don't know the word, how could you be doing that? Because the Spirit of God that was moving in my heart drove me to it. I could see my sins were filthy and foul. And I could see that God should have thrown me in hell. And I was crying out for pardon, crying out, give me the strength, O oh Christ, to turn from all of this. Help me, help me out of my self-worship. This is, this is serious. But I can tell you without any hesitation, if the Spirit of God is taking up residence in your heart at certain levels, you are mortifying. You can't help it. Because the power of God is there and informing you through the Word. Even if you don't know the Word. They will win battles. Christians will win battles to their great joy. One of the greatest thrills I have is when someone comes for counseling, various matters, and we pray with them, and we continue to pray with them, and we encourage them, and we point them to the Scriptures, we point them to Christ, and to watch them triumph over something that has enslaved them. Amen. God does that. And it's glorious, and it fills us with joy. There is no such thing as a hopeless Christian. So, uh, they'll win battles. They will also lose some. I wish that were not so. But it's the fact. Some of us lose battles to our great sorrow. <clears throat> but now listen. Listen. But the war has been won by Christ. He has won the war. He has won the war. We don't live like he did. And, and that's to his dishonor. He has won the war on the cross, hanging between heaven and earth. Jesus Christ, writhing in agony for his people, was crushing the serpent's head. Three days after that glorious, uh, glorious death, he rose again. He rose again. And God the Father uh, appointed him king over everything. 
Now that's who you serve. That's who you're in union with. And that's who gives you the great gift of the Holy Spirit. That's how much he loves his people. He didn't just die so you'd go to heaven. He gives you the gift of the Spirit so that you can bring him glory, so that you can triumph over this cadaver that you're dragging around. God's children are generally in a state of deprivation. And that can be for a lot of reasons. <clears throat> but I can assure you now, if you're not spending time in prayer, time in the Word, you're in miserable spiritual shape. That, I mean, that's just the fact. I can tell you, you can't live without air. You can't live without prayer. You cannot live without food. The scriptures talk about uh, the word of God is our necessary food. It is, get, and, and, and get out of your mind the legalistic idea that somehow uh, I can come and get favor with God just because I pray or read the Bible. That's not the point. The thing is to know our God, to bask in the relationship with him, to grow in who he is and what we are. We're not, I say this fairly regularly, maybe I don't say it enough, uh, maybe, I, maybe I'm not being encouraging enough to you, but let me just say this, God's people are safe. The issue is, are you God's people? That's it. If you've repented of your sins, believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you have life. You have life. Life, and that life must be cultivated. The scriptures make that evident. I mean, reading the scriptures and, and praying and meditating are not things that are just kind of, uh, you know, oh man, uh, uh, these are just guilt-producing factors in my life. That shouldn't be at all. You are in a relationship, a holy romance. You are in a love relationship with the living God. I mean, Paul talks about it in Galatians chapter 5. Faith that worketh by love. Faith that worketh by love. But faith doesn't just work. It has to believe something. How do you know what God wants you to do today? How do you know what God wants you to be as a man? How do you know what God wants you to be as a woman? How do you know what God wants you to be as a mother or as a father? How do you know what God wants you to be like in the office? Unless you come to his word and spend time there. How do you know who you are? I mean, it's a fair, it's a fair question to say, Christian, do you really know who you are? It's almost like uh, when we're born again, uh, the, the, the powers of darkness immediately throw a, a, a gallon of amnesia on us. It's like about the only thing I can remember is how wicked I used to be. God wants you to look in here and see what he's done for you so that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And I mean joyful life. Yeah, there are going to be sorrows. I mean, every time I am conscious of my sin, it grieves me. I get angry. I get depressed. I get. But the thing is, I should be on my knees going to the cross. That's where it's settled. If you're not living on that, what are you living on? Paycheck? Who are you? Do you know who in the world you are? Yeah. Children of God, sons of God. But what in the world does that mean? That's not just a title. That is an existence in a condition that God has supernaturally put you in. Do you believe that? I can tell you sin is running you over like a tank if you're not spending time basking in the love of God found in his word. It's right here. He gives us everything infinitely necessary to be saved and to make it to the celestial city. 
safe. Safe. The issue is, do I know who I am and do I understand what that safe includes? Right? And that's why we're talking about mortification. Paul has just told you who is safe. Those that are mortifying their sin. <clears throat> well, the war is won in Christ, so we fight on with our eyes first and foremost. Where do we look? Not here. Not here. We look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We look to the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we, we fix our eyes on our journey on our victorious king. You spend all your time looking at your failures. There's nothing but depression waiting there. One look at myself and hundreds of looks to Christ. Borrowing from Robert McChain. Brethren, when you see your sin run to Christ, don't sit there and have a pity party. Look to Christ and see what it cost him to say it is finished. Well, we look to our victorious king and we, we look on our instructions from his word. And we look on the penalty of our sins washed away in the blood of Christ. Are, do you go there regularly? Do you go there regularly? But that's the place of joy. That's the place of happiness for somebody who knows and understands what they are in the flesh. It's not about flagellating yourself. It's not about saying, oh, I'm so terrible. I'm worse than everybody. Well, you might be, but your Savior is greater than you, and his salvation is perfect. It's perfect. Look to him. And if you're looking to him, you'll be mortifying sin because you'll see sin for what it is. It's that which stains it's that which separates. That's why we look at the cross and find ourselves in union with that one who bled and died and rose again that I might triumph, that I might mortify sin. Not only that, as Paul makes abundantly clear here as we travel on that journey, and as we war in his name, we look to the strength of his spirit. This is never about looking at us for the victory. It's always looking at what Christ has done for us and looking at the spirit and the power which he's given to us. Paul could pray that our eyes would be opened, that we might see, that we might know the power to usward who believe. We should be praying that. We should be praying that regularly. He, Paul prayed it for us. Oh, I pray, oh Lord, that you would give them the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation in the knowledge of him. If you're longing for Christ, that's exactly what you need. And it's exactly what God gives his hungry children. He does. Oh, we get weighted down here with the flesh. Instead of our hearts rising up to him that loved us and gave himself for us. Well, well, <clears throat> the fact that we mortify our sins doesn't save us as such. That's already been done in the work of Christ. But it is the means by which we're walking on to glory. We're in a life where we're constantly engaged and embattled with sin. Now, for many of us, unfortunately, <laughs> we don't mind taking up that warfare with somebody else's sin. 
But boy, aren't they evil. Oh, they're really wicked. Boy, they're bad. Oh, they don't do the six things we don't do. Oh, or they do them. Oh, I, 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 I can't believe it. Get down in front of this mirror and deal with the person you're looking at here. Now, that's where we need to get. I'm not saying there are times when we cannot make observations of what is right and what is wrong, what is wicked and what is righteous. There are times that we must do that. But far too often, most of us are just fixed on, hmm, they're all bad, but not me. I don't go to the movies. Okay? That kind of stuff is just not going to wash before God. I've said numerous times, and I'll say it again. I said it in staff this week. I'd rather have a smoker. Somebody does three packs a day sitting in here than a gossip. But boy, that smoker, that's bad news, right? How about the tongue? How's your tongue doing? Are you, are you using it for edification? Are you building up in the faith? Are you encouraging your brethren? Or uh, do you like to chew on them, especially when they're not around? No, my friends, we need to be at war with our sin mm -hmm. <laughs> and realizing that it is the children of God that do that. That's what Paul is telling us in very plain language. <clears throat> so it's evidence. It is evidence. Your mortification of sin is evidence that you're in Christ. It is evidence that you are in the Spirit, as Paul has been saying throughout this chapter. It's evidence that you are a child of God. You want assurance? Here's a good place to go. Now, I'll tell you what most people want when they want assurance, when they say that, you know, oh, God, I'm wrestling with assurance. Now, now this is not true for everybody. I want to be careful. I know that I'm broad brush painting right here. This is a broad brush statement, but I am leaving a footnote, right? I'm leaving a caveat. This is not true about everybody. But the fact of the matter is, very often when we want assurance, is we want a great big fat feeling to fall on us. That's what we want. Oh, I'm a child of God. Okay? Now, God can do that, and he does do that, but the most important place that you and I should get our assurance is the Word of God, which reveals the person and work of Jesus Christ, and go back to the gospel and say, have I repented of my sins and believed on this Savior? And very often people say, well, yeah, but I'm struggling with sin. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You weren't. I mean, th this is what he's talking about. If you have been transformed, you're in a battle with your sins. And there'll be times when they knock you down and you'll find out, wow, indwelling sin stronger than I thought. I thought I was holier than this. Right? Well, you're, not, you're not reading this book carefully enough. Come in here. Come into this, this glorious drawing room of the Lord Jesus Christ. And spend some time talking to him about who you are. That's right. He will tell you. Well, he's just, Paul has just told us. That Jesus has said to us, for they, for as many as are led by the Spirit, led in mortification of sin, they are the children of God. not earning it it's evidence that you are alive Christ has done everything Paul has already given us five chapters on how he's done everything to save us uh, and and that we are uh, justified by faith alone in him alone and now he's sanctifying us and sanctification includes mortification so then now, having said all that, we come to, finally, what is mortification? Well, I mean, what is it?
Let us hear the voice of the Holy Spirit clearly. This is what Paul says. If ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Now that's what he said. So what does he mean? What does he mean by the word mortify? Mortify. In the New Testament, two Greek words are translated with the English mortify. Here in Romans 8.13, the first Greek word appears and it means to put to death. To put to death. Now, right away, uh, that should raise a flag. That should raise a question in your thinking. How do I kill a sin? <laughs> if mortification is the mortification of sin, um, exactly how does one hunt that? How, how, how does one um, demise that? What is Paul, what's Paul talking about? <clears throat> well, the word not only means just to put to death, which is clear, it means to cause the total cessation of activity. Hmm. That's stout. The second Greek word appears in Colossians 3, 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication. Uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Well, that's quite a lineup. Once again, mortify means to put to death. It means to kill. John Owen says this. He says that the words... If ye do mortify, are a metaphorical expression. Now, children, and for anybody else that this might be helpful to, children especially, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help you, a metaphor, he says that this is a metaphorical expression. A metaphor is what we call a figure of speech. It's a way of expressing something. <clears throat> it is a way of describing one thing with a word that we usually use for another thing. We describe this thing by this thing. They don't look like they're the same thing, and they're not exactly the same, but they share enough in common that we use this word to describe this word. Now, you th may think that sounds confusing, but I will now show you. We do this all the time. All of us do this. <clears throat> if we say to somebody, he is a lion in battle, that's a metaphor. Right? He is a giant among football players. Right? Well, is he really a giant? Is he really a giant in the way we, we understand giant? Yeah. She's so sweet. She's a peach. Right? Those are metaphors. We're using something that everybody understands, and we're saying this thing here is like this. Right? So we know that when we say he is a lion in battle, of course the man is not a lion. But he's bold and he's strong like a lion. Understand then? So, <clears throat> in fact, let me, let me take it just a little bit further and then we'll, we'll go on. You see, it makes a description more powerful. 
Like I said, whether we're talking about a man who's like a lion or a woman who's a peach. All right, we all know peach is something sweet, something delightful. So we're, we're making the description more powerful by using a metaphor. Okay, now let's, let's take that and go back to what Owen's saying to us. He says that what Paul is saying here is a metaphorical expression taken from putting of any living thing to death. Mortify the deeds of the body. All right? To kill a man, says Owen, or any other living thing is to take away the principle of his strength, his vigor, and his power so that he cannot act or exert or put forth any proper actings of his own. Close quote. In other words, we diminish, we rob him of his power and his ability to do anything. He said, now that's what Paul's doing. Paul has given us a metaphor. It's, it's like when we kill someone, but none of us know what that's like. God willing, I hope none of us know that by uh, experience. You may have, though, uh, perhaps in the military or maybe, in, even in, uh, maybe even in a life of crime. But let me just say this. <clears throat> when you kill someone, you have deprived him of his ability to do what he does. Right? Owen gets it. He says, that's what Paul's talking about. Sin is not a person that we can kill. But like a person, like a person, it is a force. It is powerful. It's still within us and it tempts us. And sometimes it produces sinful works in and through us. And that's a great grief to God's children, isn't it? When we fail, when we fail our Christ, that's, that's one of the most acute pains in life. <clears throat> Did you ever get angry with your sin? And not just because, oh, I thought I had a perfect record. We know better than that. All right, none of you have that. I'm beginning behind the pulpit here. Paul is getting at something that every one of us must understand. There is a power within us that draws us like a magnet to what is wrong, to what is sinful. Uh-oh, I'm in trouble. I'm going to lie and blame my sister. Where'd that come from? It came from that power of sin within you. Oh, I stole something. I knew I shouldn't have stole that. Shouldn't have stolen that. Maybe you just took somebody's necklace or maybe you stole their reputation or slaughtered their reputation with your tongue why'd you do that and i'm talking about christians right now too I, you know it isn't like oh i believe in the lord jesus christ sin is gone i've been purified and i never sin again that is the way the lord ordained it he wants you in the fight he gets glory in your fight he says you want to take revenge on that which held you slave? I've given you all the goods to do it. That's good news. I mean, I think that's wonderful. Well, <coughs> here's the deal. By God's grace, we can mortify. That is, we can ruin and destroy the power of, Life and strength of sin within us by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the teaching of the Word of God and it is one of the most neglected and ignored doctrines in Scripture. It's almost as if once we're saved, we just enjoy talking about how foul and wicked we are. 
We're just beggars looking for bread. No, you're more than that. I challenge that thinking. When you come to Christ, of course, you're, you're like a beggar, just coming for bread. But that, I'm going to tell you what, the one who gives you the bread doesn't just say, here, go on your way. He brings you into his family, and you are sharing his kingdom with him. Amen. And he wants to see you walking in such a way as to bring his glorious love and grace and make it uh, available, make it clear to the world. Amen. Do we get that? Yes. Or do you like to just to hunker down and go, yeah, just real bad? I tell you what, that, that's one of the reasons some people only want to hear sermons that just make them feel better. Well, I want you to feel better. How about that? <laughs> I know some of you don't think that, but I do. I'm going to do everything I can, as I said a few weeks ago, to knock every prop out from under you that will keep you from resting entirely on Jesus. That's what I want, because that's where joy is. That's how Paul could be in a prison and say to the people on the outside, rejoice in the Lord always. Amen. And again, I say rejoice. No, it's, it, it comes when we get into this serious issue of mortification and we start dealing with that thing that's just, mm, it won't go away. And we go to the Lord and we say, oh, take it away. And he says, no, you do it. I'm right here. You do it. I gave you my spirit, gave you my word, gave you my people. You do it. And watch the glory. When I was younger, I always wanted to beat my dad in arm wrestling. My dad was a former farm boy. He was strong. He was strong until he died. <clears throat> and we'd, 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 we'd get to the table and I'd say, okay, let's go. And he would always take my hand and I'd be doing everything and he'd start doing this. And I'm putting everything in my body and against it. And he's going, okay. All right, that's the way it went for years, for years. And I'd do everything. I'd, I'd, I'd be holding on to the table. I'd be doing everything I could. He'd just take me down over and again. But I stayed at it. And eventually, the year came when we started going and we both started sweating. And I wasn't going anywhere, and he wasn't going like this. And we stayed with it and stayed with it, and all of a sudden he couldn't believe that he was going down. Let me tell you what. At that moment in my life, I felt like I had, you know, climbed the highest mountain on the planet. I felt that I had done something super spectacular, all right? But there was a thrill of actually... <clears throat> it, was, it was just overwhelming the Lord wants you to do that with your sins Amen. it's all his grace now if any of you are not listening carefully you may be thinking the pastor is saying something like this well you become a Christian and God just dumps all this stuff on you and you got to do it yourself you're not listening God has given you his spirit you have everything you need I mean, your armory is fit. <laughs> your strength is what it needs to be. You've got to believe God. Oh, you mean the just shall live by faith. That's right. You live all the time by faith. Trusting Jesus Christ and thanking him that he's given you his spirit to wage warfare. Now, <clears throat> again, the idea here is not that we can eradicate all sin. I'll talk more about that in just a moment. The fact is, <clears throat> by the power God has given you and by faith in him, you are able, you are able to take on that thing that has been 
crushing you, that has been humiliating you, that has been <sighs> dragging you through the, the, the mud and the muck. You can do that. See, Satan wants to, Satan wants to get on this. Dr. Lloyd-Jones gave a, a beautiful uh, example once, and I'm, and I'm using his example. He says, Satan cannot have the Christian, but he can climb up on the fence. He's separated from the believer by a big fence, but he can climb up on the fence and he can shout at you and he can convince you that he's the one that's right. Listen to me. And we're foolish enough to listen. We're foolish enough to listen. You have what you need to resist. I'm not going to say it's going to be a breeze. It may be the most difficult battle of your life. Are you up for that? God has given you what you need to ward off these things. You have to know who you are. You are a child of God. And he has given you his spirit. He has given you his unchanging word in a world of lies. He's given his people to love you, even when you fail. Unless you're in a group of Pharisees. <clears throat> now, indwelling sin, then, is a reality in believers. It's a reality. And we know this by experience, right? Haven't you looked at something and said, you know, that's wrong. And after you look at it for a little longer, it's like, well, maybe it's not that wrong. Well, maybe it's not that bad. Oh, famous preacher X says it's okay. I'll do it. Hmm. It's a bad way to treat your conscience, by the way. Be careful. At least be certain that the word of God is being handled well. <clears throat> so we know by experience that indwelling sin is real. And we know by the Holy Scriptures, which often speak of sin that dwelleth in me. When I would do good, evil is present with me. I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. And the law there, again, means a principle. It's, it's like something that rules me. It may be your tongue. It may be your attitude. It, it may be your temper. It may be your eating. It may be all kinds of things that are like, man, this has got me. And you need to realize who you are at that point. Okay, I know that indwelling sin is here. Lord, help me to mount up the battle. Show me how to mount up that battle. And he will. We will eventually get there. Okay, so then every believer in Christ has a duty to obey Christ in mortification. He will be working with you. He's never up there with this. I'm too busy for you. That's not happening. He's the living God. He is the intercessor for each one of his people. When you come to him saying, you know what's going on in me. I need help. He says, okay, let's go. Let's go. We can take that. We can begin to take those things on. He's not going to give you the, the, the biggest and the baddest to begin with. But they come down the pike. Every believer in Christ has a duty to mortify. That is Paul's point. For as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. The sons of God are involved in doing this. Maybe it's something you're listening to. Maybe it's something you're wearing. Maybe it's something you're watching. Maybe it's something that just happens to creep in to your life. And it's like, how did this get here? That does happen occasionally. Very often the enemy, the enemy likes to say, oh, you left all that over there. You know, don't you want to look at it again? Wasn't it fun? Wasn't it fun? 
hey, you, you've been doing okay. It's been rough for you lately. Why don't you treat yourself? Knew a man who was addicted. It was in my former church. He was addicted to cocaine. And he would do, he would do anything for that next, that next blow of cocaine. And uh, one night he went out to get uh, chicken dinner for his wife and his family. And he didn't come back for a week. And he came back dirty and barefoot. He had sold the van, his van, which was their only way of transportation, for $500 and went straight up his nose. And he would tell me over and over and over, I can't quit this. And I'd say, yes, you can. You can in Christ. You can in Christ. <clears throat> you can. I know a pastor that began to drink. His congregation at moments was so hateful toward him. He actually is one of the finest men I know. He finally went home, and when he would go out on the road to speak somewhere, he'd drink to medicate himself. Can churches do that to pastors? Well, there's a whole lot of factors in that. But yeah, people can feel like, why am I even doing this? Right? <clears throat> and he got to where he was drinking every time he went out of town, not just once in a while. And he got to where he was drinking when he got home. But it was out on the road. A policeman, in God's wonderful providence, arrested him because he was weaving in his car. You say, oh, that doesn't happen to Christians. Have you ever read 1 Corinthians? They showed up at the Lord's Supper drunk. Of course these things can happen. But what happened? He repented, which is the beginning of mortification. He repented. He looked to Christ. He cast himself on the mercy of his church. He was out of the pulpit for a couple of years, and now he's back preaching. Can people overcome that kind of thing? Yes, they can. And depending on the, the nature of the church, which have virtually driven him to it, now it was his own weakness was in it. He will tell you, you know, you can't just blame other people. But there are always things that the enemy uses. They don't like me anymore. I need to medicate. Well, mortification is a constant and present duty for every regenerate soul because indwelling sin remains until the Lord graciously and mercifully takes us home. The day will come when the battle's over and we will join the victorious king for all eternity. Well, um, <clears throat> let me, let me, do one thing here. No, actually, two things. First, then, after all of this, we want to we want to look at mortification defined, defined. Mortification defined. So, after all that we've said, all we've talked about, mortification is the believer's continuous act. Mortification is the believer's continuous act by the power of the Holy Spirit. To weaken, ruin, and destroy the life and power of indwelling sin. You're not going after a person, but you are dealing with a power that's very present. <clears throat> so that you, you, you destroy its power so that it does not bring forth sinful works. That doesn't usually sit down. It uh, doesn't usually happen by just sitting down and saying, okay, I'm done with this. <clears throat> happens occasionally in some people, but, but rarely. And one of the reasons we continue to stumble and fall back into certain sins is because we don't recognize what mortification is and what we're capable of by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ empowered by the Holy Spirit. Mortification is the believer's continuous act by the power of the Holy Spirit to weaken ruin and destroy the life and power of indwelling sin so that it does not bring forth sinful works. It's possible. Some of you here have triumphed over things that dogged you for a long time because Christ gave you the grace to stay in the battle and you learned how to handle 
the weapons that the Lord gave you. And it's joyful. That's when it's worth all of the agony of the battle. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll go back to what uh, mortification is and more of that next week. What I, will, what I will say today is when it comes to this particular matter, I believe with, with all of my heart that it is an aspect of the Christian life that at least as far as modern Christianity goes is often ignored or utterly neglected. And God's people walk around like prisoners all of the time when indeed they don't need to be. Now, I'll tell you why some uh, give it up. It's because it's hard. <clears throat> you know, parents, if you love your children, you give them some hard things to do and make sure they go through with them. If you don't do that, you are crippling them for a world that's going to deal them all kind of hard things. <clears throat> Our God in heaven so loves his people. He has so, so loved us that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But for many in America and around the world, that since we've shipped so much American religion to other people, is that, oh, okay, if I, if I make a decision before God, then everything's okay and I will go to heaven someday. It doesn't really matter how I live. They wouldn't put it that way, but that's exactly how they live. When in fact, people that are being led by the Spirit realize I'm locked in war. And I, I know that my God has set me free and I like being free. I do not want to go back to what I was and what I am in the flesh without Christ. There's not a thing I've done in my past that I couldn't do ten times worse before this day is up if, if I were to stop the battle. It's not about cruising to heaven. It's a battle. It's a war. You were at war with God. Now you're at war with your sin. This world is always going to be about a warfare. But because of who and what you are, by the grace of Christ, you can do this. I'm telling you. I'm standing here still free from many things because by God's grace, I've had to fight them. There must always be a biblical balance, and that's crucial. But we will talk about that more in the next message. Brethren, I say to you, your marriage will change if you're married. Your relationship with your children will change if you get a hold of this. Your, your relationships in church will change if you get a hold of this. And it, it's a challenge. I'm not telling you that one aspect of it is easy other than this. <clears throat> To struggle with, with sin and to fall occasionally, to cry out to God and to be rescued and to spend your life in that pattern and then go to, to glory is better than taking the easy ride and dropping off to hell. Amen. That's what Paul's telling us. Those that are led by the Spirit are in the battle. They're in the battle. Well, they might be losing it this particular... Okay, but you're going to make it. Listen, you will if you believe your God and walk with him. Amen. It's all in faith in the conquering of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not perfectionism. Uh, that's, I didn't get to that. But I will tell you, it's not perfectionism. It doesn't mean that you will be sinless before you die. You're going to be fighting it to the end. But you can. In Christ, you can conquer many things. Let's pray. Holy Savior, we, we need Thee every day. We're weak and feeble and pathetic. And there's not one of us, oh Lord, that especially on days when we're so tired of the battle, we didn't just throw up our hands and run back into the world. <clears throat> but Your children won't do that because You continue to give them Thy blessed grace. Oh, we know that some have uh, attempted to run back to their vomit 
But they, they came back like the prodigal. Oh, God, help. Help your people in these days to know that thou hast not called them simply to a hospital. But thou hast called them to the barracks. Thou hast called them into the, uh, the armed forces of heaven. And, oh, God, that thou hast set us in this world to be lights, bright and shining lights, and to be overcomers. Help us to do that. And now, O oh Christ, bless your, your, your children here. Lord, if, if one of them is struggling, if one of them is struggling, I pray that they heard rightly this morning and that they have, by God's mercy and God's grace, that which will carry them through if they will believe their Christ. They believe him and believe what God has done for them. Lord, I, I, I know what the bottom of, of the chasm feels like, but I know that thou dost lift up thy children. I pray, bless them, encourage them, get them in the battle who, uh, for those that are not. Lord, help them to get in the battle and help them to see life change because they believe thee, because they resist the powers of darkness rather than bowing their heads and giving in over and over again. Lord God, thy gospel is the power of God unto salvation, and thy spirit filling thy people is the power by which we may conquer through faith in Christ. Help us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand with me. <clears throat> I want to use this passage that uh, Pastor Clarence and I both often refer to in our benediction. I want you to listen very carefully. <clears throat> In, in, in the event that you're drooping, in the event that you're struggling, which, by the way, we'll happily talk with you about any time. <clears throat> but listen what the inspired word says. Now, the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect. Make you perfect. Don't deny him. Make you perfect in every good work to do his will. The word perfect here means mature. Make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. He loves us. We will complete the journey by faith in him. Let's go in his name.